Um, Stacy Chu, for those who don't know, is a second year fellow, just like she wrote on her slide. Mm -hmm. I'm sure happy to be in the second year from the more arduous first year. Um, it just to give some historical perspective on this, you know, we've been doing this, what we used to call journal club and now teaching series for almost 50 years. Um, and I can remember a presentation on this probably a good 40 years ago when we used to do them at the cafeteria over at the University Hospital at Montlake, at which time a lot of um, thinking about chronic urticaria was that it was undiagnosed food allergy. And uh, uh, a now deceased allergist gave the presentation and he brought in, I can remember laying out on the table, maybe a hundred self-made food skin tests for the diagnosis of chronic urticaria. And people would always react to something um, just as a counterpoint as to how far the science of this has come. Um, that That's, I mean, clearly wrong and clearly antiquated thinking, but believe it or not, the way things were done back then. Also, we just recently changed the name. This used to be good enough to just call it chronic idiopathic urticaria, but in the last year or two, it's changed to chronic spontaneous urticaria. So, Stacey, uh, with that background, why don't you go ahead and get started? Sounds perfect. So, good morning, everyone. As he had just mentioned, I'm one of our second year fellows, and I'm very excited to be giving this talk this morning with you all. Thanks for lending me your ears. I have no disclosures to start things off, and then I wanted to put up the word of the day for everyone to have right here. Oh, that's odd. Oh, sorry. <laughs> The word of today is autumn, and I think it's very fitting for this lovely autumn day. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video as well just to save bandwidth. So our objectives for today are going to be threefold, to realize the impact of chronic spontaneous urticaria on our patients, to review what's known about the mechanisms of CSU and treatments for it, and to gain some insights into the future of CSU. So as we know, our patients have these primitive, very well circumcised, we raise erythematous plaques, and typically they will come and go within 24 hours. Um, if they last longer, that would be atypical. For them to be chronic, they need to occur for six or more weeks, of course, and for them to be spontaneous, they need to occur with no obvious trigger, meaning that they're not, um, you know, inducible or some other sort, which we're not going to focus on specifically today, but I am going to be talking about those just as we are mindful of our different evaluations for our patients. It typically can present, you know, in that third to fifth decade of life, but as we know, it can present in kiddos, it can present in older adults, and the average duration is about two to, two to five years. I wanted to also mention here that, you know, of course, we're all very aware that angioedema is a significant consideration when you're thinking about CSU. 10% of our patients have angioedema alone, and of the rest, about half and half will have urticaria alone or urticaria with angioedema. Just because there is so much information already go through here, I didn't focus specifically on angioedema, but as we are aware, it is part of this condition as well. So jumping in, today's focus really is going to be on our patients. Patients for me is how I framed my thought process going all through my medical career. That's how I really solidify information. It just really brings it home for me and um, makes medicine, you know, a fun career path. Thinking about our patients, you know, I think it's always important to be you know, in their mindset to understand what they're going through and to know kind of what they're dealing with day to day. For me, I have some idea of what they do, but I will say that I think my case probably is quite mild. I never had to, um, you know, miss school or have anything that really impacted what I was doing. I was just a little bit more uncomfortable. But for a lot of our patients, they have these really sudden fluctuating symptoms. They had this pruritus, these lesions, they can have perceived pain. And that really impacts them. They can have disrupted sleep, they'll be very fatigued, they can have impaired concentration, irritability, and really a lot of embarrassment over what's going on. Also very important for us to keep in mind is that anxiety and depression have a very high comorbidity with CSU. 
ranging up to 60%. So 60% of our patients really are very affected and they're also going through a lot of other things that I think is important to be mindful of. This is gonna be one of our first QR codes. If you guys haven't seen my presentation last year, just so you know, all of my references I link in with QR codes. You can use your phone to scan these in. I do have some pages that have multiple codes and then the author's names are below them to demarcate what we're gonna be talking about. So kind of coming back to disinfectant patients, I think taking this in the context of real data that we can understand is, is really important. And you know, there's two facts here that really were shocking to me when I learned them. The first is that patients with TDSU have worse physical function, pain perception, and perceived health than patients with respiratory allergies. This is really a big impact on their life, and it's really quite bothersome for them. Secondly, they have more impairment in social functioning than patients with type 1 diabetes. And, you know, as somebody who's internal medicine trained and really saw the impact of diabetes on patients, I know that that's a very significant impact in someone's life. And as someone with CSU, I would agree that it is, but that just really, as a fact, um, I think brought home how important this is for us to understand. So as we evaluate patients, you know, we have their thoughts and we have how they feel. Of course, we need to know quantifiable information and we have our scoring systems for that. I won't go into all the details here. I know that everyone here is familiar with uh, UAS 7. This helps to kind of quantify that urticaria over a week. But I also wanted to give a shout out to different health-related quality of life indices. There's, there's quite a few of them. The World Allergy Organization over in Europe, you know, everyone has a little bit of a different mix on what they do. But just across the board, it is recommended that these are used on every single follow-up patient visit. So you can kind of track how patients are doing and really get some impact into what's going on with them. And I think this kind of information, you know, as a questionnaire, as a quality of life indices, really makes sense because we have so many patients that we just need to understand. Oh, sorry about the little bit of the graphic got mixed up there, but um, apologies for that. So in the United States, we have 500,000 patients that have chronic urticaria. Thinking more globally, there's, of course, even more. We have urticaria worldwide. We do have, you know, good data in some of the different continents. In Asia, for example, South America, we know that there are higher rates of urticaria, which makes sense when you think about that key patient population. The data in Africa, we don't have quite as much yet, but I think, you know, everyone's working on that. All in all, urticaria affects about, we would say, 1% of the world population, kind of in a range of ages. And really shockingly, the prevalence has increased two to tenfold in the last decade. So um, I think there's a lot of reasons why that could be the case, of course, with more awareness, et cetera, that is rising. But we do know that other topic conditions also are becoming more prevalent, and that's just something for us to be keeping in mind. So with Stacey, all of the... Stacey, mm -hmm. I mean, do you really think it varies this much from continent to continent, or is this just the variability of reporting data? You know, I do think it does because when you look at the key patients that have urticaria, the highest prevalence is in um, kind of like middle-aged Asian females. Um, so I would say with that information, Asia definitely makes sense to me. That's something that um, you wanna look not shocking. I will say the South America data was um, interesting, but you know, I would say that's not as surprising as um, I guess one might think when you keep that in mind that there's quite a few patients in Asia that have that key demographic. So thinking on the impact in society, because we do have all of these different patients, you know, I really wanted to put it in the context of how this impacts not just patients, but you know, the United States, the world as a whole. There's been studies on how children and adults, you know, perform when they have CSU. And there's a few things that I'll talk about for each. For children, it's been shown that children with chronic urticaria have a higher rate of quote unquote, bad school performance. So, you know, this is just one study and it's a little bit hard to say what bad school performance is, but there was, you know, more than a double 
of the demarcation for patients having bad school performance compared to patients without chronic urticaria. Additionally, patients with chronic urticaria will miss more school. There's a range in how much school they'll miss, but it's you know definitely there that they're missing more school than their peers. And then their parents, of course, are taking time off because of their children's urticaria. So 3.3% of parents in one study needed to take off time to go and take care of their child when they had chronic um, urticaria flares. And I think that was really interesting as well. So when I've never had that, that is just something to keep in mind for all of our patients. Thinking about adults, you know, they're having issues too. They're also missing not school, but work. There are 6% higher obstancies in patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria. They have a 25% worse working impairment and their overall work, product work productivity loss is 27%. And you know, when you think about that, that's really pretty significant of a number. If you ask employed patients with CSU about how much work they've lost, maybe in the last week, then 20% of them would say that they had lost one working hour at least. And this is very surprising to me. 62% had missed a working day, um, which that part was very interesting that they had um, included that, but, but that's something that was also very shocking to me. And when you think about all of these patients that are missing work, that are you know pulling their kids out of school, you have to think about that economic impact of chronic spontaneous urticaria on the U.S. and on the world. In the United States, there is an estimated cost of two hundred and forty-four million dollars from CSU. And then, really bringing it back to our patients, they have a pretty much two thousand dollar cost per year per patient with CSU and urticaria. And I think, you know, that is just something that, once again, really, I want to keep that in mind when I'm seeing patients. I think that's a big chunk of change for really anybody that's going to be in the United States, but especially in some of our, you know, lower socioeconomic status areas. That's a very significant amount of money, and I think it's really important just to be mindful of that. So looking at all of this, you know, what is our role in helping with this condition that obviously impacts a lot of people, impacts people all across the United States, impacts people all across the world. I think our role is the same role that we always have. You know, we educate ourselves, we become very knowledgeable, and then we educate our patients in a very empathetic and understanding way so that they know there's somebody here with them to walk them through this journey because it is, for many people, a very, very long-lasting condition. In this pathway, we're going to be talking about pathophysiology of chronic spontaneous urticaria, associations, and treatment, and then we also will talk about kind of some of the considerations that we're pushing into the, forward, into the future of urticaria. Pathophysiology, of course, is something that everyone has been really taking a microscope to for quite some time, trying to figure out what's been going on, and we have a good amount of information now. Of course, we know mast cells and basophils are truly key players in, in CSU. That's, you know, without a doubt. But also, you know, there are a number of other cells that are involved, and we're going to touch on these as well. But first, you know, you can't talk about urticaria without talking about mast cells. So we're going to dive into these first. I really liked what um, you know Delauer had talked about during his talk last week. I think it was a really good overview that mast cells really can be um, activated by multiple stimuli in very complex environments. And I wanted to include that kind of doc that picture that he had put up as well because I thought it was so good. And of course, there are many, many, many you know areas that could be activated. We're going to focus on the ones that are really relevant or thought to be relevant in CSU. So when we think about you know, mast cells in CSU, we know that in tissue biopsy, there is mast cell degranulation and elevating histamine. These are really the key players that we know of in CSU. It's controversial whether or not there is an increased actual number of mast cells that's been reported in some places and not reported in some places. But kind of um, looking at everything going through, we know that when mast cells degranulate, they will release histamine, proteases, and cytokines. They will also generate platelet activating factor and arachidonic acid metabolites, including prostaglandin D2, leukotriene C4, D4, and E4. 
And this results in that vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, and stimulation of sensory nerve endings that really leads to that swelling, itchiness, red, redness, all of that discomfort that our patients are really feeling. And I thought these paper or these pictures were just so beautiful. Um, so if you wanted to scan in here, there's you know a lot more, but what a beautiful review of kind of that that in motion. Thinking about why mast cells degranulate. You know, there's some that we know and there's some that we are trying to figure out. This concept of autoimmunity and the potential role for IgG class I antibodies emerged in the 1980s. And now we know that 30 to 50 percent of patients that produce specific IgG antibodies to the FC epsilon R1 alpha subunit component of that high affinity Ig receptor exists. And approximately 5 to 10 percent, 5 to 10 percent produce IgG antibodies against IgE itself. These IgG molecules activate complement and liberate C5A, which is really, really well shown up here. And that, of course, augments mast cell secretion. And then there are also these patients that have Ig autoantibodies to autoantigens, such as thyroproxidase and IL-24. We're going to touch a little bit about, you know, how we clinically think about this information when we get to workup, but this is just kind of to outline that, that mechanism. Of course, as promised, um, there is, oh goodness, um, there is also, you know, other information that has come to light and that people are digging more into. It's been found that there are artery, autoreactive CD4 T cells to the um, alpha chain of the Ig subunit in a subset of patients, and that most of these autoreactive T cells are creating interferon gamma, gamma. There's also this theory that there's kind of an increased mast cell releasability and active CSU. Of course, we talked earlier about the question of whether or not there's more mast cells, what's going on. That is something that I think people are really trying to tease out and think about. This is reinforced that histamine responses have been shown to be increased in patients with CSU and that results with CSU remission. So if you're testing somebody that has CSU versus a person without, then their histamine control or histamine response typically will be larger. And then additionally, there is this interesting mass-related gene X2. It's a novel G protein coupled receptor expressed in human mast cells that binds basic proteins. And that's known to be increased in the skin of patients with CSU as well. So a lot of this information is knowing here's what we're finding and let's dig into what that means clinically for our patients. And then lastly, you know, thinking about mast cells and kind of specific mechanisms for them, I wanted to think about the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade, as we know, really is a very, very broad player. This damage to blood vessels exposes tissue factor and triggers this extrinsic event cascade. And then these various activated elements will um, activate protein activated receptors on multiple cell types, creating this amplification of pro-inflammatory mediators. And in patients with CSU, plasma levels of prothrombin fragment 1 and 2 and D-dimer are higher than those in normal controls, and that does correlate with disease, disease severity and the response to treatment. So that's something that, you know, was really exciting and interesting when I learned about that, um, and that's something that I'm going to be keeping an eye on in the future in terms of recommendations for evaluations. So now moving away from mast cells, our big player, we're going to talk about basophils next and then touch on eosinophils as well. So thinking about basophils and CSU, we know that basophils are present in those wheels. Oh, apologies, that's a typo. It's supposed to be wheels, not wheels. Um, but we know that basophils carry IgE receptors and are capable of producing histamine cytokines, and um, including I IL-4, IL-13, and IL-31 in response to that IgE receptor activation. We also interestingly know that patients with CSU have lower circulating basophil counts than their um, patient, then they're controlled without CSU. And they also have these hyporesponsive basophils that exhibit reduced histamine degranulation in response to those Ig antibodies. And that part is, is really very interesting to think about. We also realize that the number of basophils in peripheral blood is negatively correlated with the urticarial disease symptom activities, and this suggests in, my, in many minds, and as well as my mind, that basophil recruitment to the skin does contribute to skin symptoms. <laughs> 
To really reinforce that thought, there is an improvement in basopenia and basophil Ig receptor abnormalities when patients naturally have improvement to CSU, and I think that really points towards the importance of basophils as an important contributor to the disease. And then also, the blood basophils of patients who recover from CSU, once again, release more histamine when they're challenged. So, you know, I think all of our patients, when they go and they Google or look up urticaria, mast cells are gonna pop up, and I think oftentimes, you know, people forget about basophils, they forget about the other players, and this is something that is just so important for us to understand and be able to explain to them. Next, talking about eosinophils, we know that eosinophils are now I think a bigger component of CSU than previously thought. Eosinophils and their granules are present in those wheels and patients with CSU also have low peripheral blood eosinophils in addition to low blood basophils. There's been many possible mechanisms proposed, including that there is once again that depletion of the blood eosinophils by recruitment to the skin, but also that there's maybe an immunologic destruction in the blood, you know, a lot of kind of in the air thoughts. Treatments aimed at reducing eosinophil accumulation activation, as we know since our biologics, has been reported to reduce CSU symptoms, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and I think that once again reinforces that they are very important and there's something going on there. And then, of course, we have all of our other cells. It's not just mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. If you look at a wheel and you look at the perivascular infiltrate of cells around in the area, you know that you have CD4 lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils as well. And then you also know that the epithelial and endothelial cells are playing those really, really important roles in the other factors, such as the coagulation cascade and things that I had talked about. There's a lot more data here, and it's really very interesting. I didn't go into all of it, but if anyone's um, curious, you know, I'd love to chat sometime about these things. So now thinking about all of those different players and how complex things are, you know, of course, it makes sense that there are so many associations found with CSU. And these are ones that I know everybody here is incredibly familiar with. I'm not going to go through and talk about each of these specifically, but we know that there's these chronic infectious processes, which are quite large in our thoughts, systemic conditions, thyroid disease, neoplasms, and endocrine disorders, all of which have been associated with CSU. And these are things that I always think about when I'm evaluating patients now. I've been learning more and more about these all throughout kind of residency and fellowship, and um, now I make sure that I include that in my evaluations. So speaking of evaluations, I just wanted to go through and talk very briefly on, you know, the approach to clinical history taking that I have. Of course, once again, everybody here is an expert on CSU and already has their own very, very excellent plans on how they want to approach a patient evaluation, but these are the things that I go through, you know, like onset of symptoms, timing, the frequency, duration, location of wheels, presence of pruritus, very big, precipitating factors, relation to activity, and responses to treatment. And if that's just for us to have there as a quick reminder. I promised that I wasn't gonna forget entirely about the chronic induced voter carriers because of course this is a big component as well of you know our thoughts when we're evaluating patients. Though 80% of patients with chronic urticaria have um, spontaneous urticaria, that smaller amount does have the inducible form or can it can co-occur as well. Um, so I think it's important for us to be mindful of this. I mean, everyone here knows if someone comes in and they have chronic urticaria and the history points to one of these things, it's typically quite clear. You know, I think um, when someone comes in, if they get it from the sun or they get it from um, kind of like delayed pressure, they're going to be somewhat aware of that. And then of course we are aware of how you can do those evaluations and what can you do moving forward for them. Hey, yeah, I have think a comment. The one, the one thing that's a bit confusing here is virtually everybody with chronic spontaneous urticaria is also dermatographic. Um, the, the other kinds of inducible urticaria are obvious uh, historically very often, but dermatographia is usually is a component, just a skin quality of almost everybody with chronic spontaneous urticaria. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a really good point, Lynn. I'm glad that you brought that up because I, you know, have been thinking about that for, for quite some time. I will say that I also am dermatographic and that was one of the first things that I noticed about myself growing up that everybody was. Um, and I do now evaluate that for all of our patients and I will say surprisingly, there are a number of patients that I've at least seen that, that aren't dermatographic, maybe not pushing quite hard enough or something, but um, it definitely is the most, I guess, prevalent when you're doing those evaluations, both in patients with CSU and then also kind of like generally, it's very, very common compared to these other um, inducible urticaria. So that's a really good thought um, and really important to know that the things can happen in conjunction and that we need to be thinking about things kind of more holistically for our patients. Thanks for mentioning that one. So thinking about our evaluations, you know, the evaluations that we can perform for CSU are, are quite broad. I'm going to talk about what we do in the United States and also kind of compare that to what they do in Europe, just so we have some idea of some variances. Um, as Len really importantly mentioned before, we've come a really long way in our understanding of how to evaluate these patients. And we know now that it's really this kind of inherent mechanism to their bodies. It is not from some kind of inhalant for the majority, it is not from food, like foods causing them issues. Um, many of them do not have associated conditions, so do not perform those evaluations unless they have a clinical history of that, of course. Um, and then we also, as an aside, know that you shouldn't do auto autologous skin serum testing just for every single patient here in the US. We're gonna talk about some other things and thoughts on that, but um, those are things that we know not to do. And then also, you know, the basic lab work that we always think about is also optional. You know, a CBC differential, ESR, CRP, LFTs, TSH, those are things that you can perform if somebody has an unremarkable history and physical exam and a number of things. They would like some reassurance. You, you know, have some thoughts on what could be going on that make you push yourself to consider getting lab work, all these things. But they're, of course, not mandatory. These are things that are completely optional depending on clinical judgment. And then these I just wanted to throw in as an aside, of course, make sure you're evaluating for HAE in patients with angioedema, and then to consider other evaluations for um, other etiologies such as urticaria vasculitis or the very rare Schnitzler syndrome. These are things that, of course, when you're doing that history, you're going to be the one to catch this, and these are things that you really don't want to miss. As I mentioned earlier, I promised we would talk about kind of doing those testing for those associated conditions. This is something that I know all of us here know, but just to remind us, you know, screening for thyroid disease is very low yield in patients without very specific thyroid related symptoms, and it's not typically recommended. And by that, I mean those autoantibodies are things that you really don't have to do unless you have some kind of concern. And that goes with really a lot of other evaluations. You know, there are many things that can be performed um, that really should only happen if, if it's a targeted reason. And I didn't want to forget our special populations. I think it's really important for us to keep in mind not just our typical patient, but also the more atypical patients. Um, so here we have discussion of children, pregnant patients, and immunodeficiency patients. For children, really the main thing that I wanted to say was that we know the majority of urticaria in children is that acute urticaria. It's not going to be a CU, but it is found in patients. There's both inducible and spontaneous urticaria that can occur, and that's just something for us to be mindful of. For our pregnant patients, you know, I think the biggest thing here is just um, to remember that there's other things that can look like urticaria. So the per pregnant patients that would be POP is the pruritic urticaria populals and plaques of pregnancy. And just kind of understanding the differences between those is something that I think is um, important for us to, under, to, to, to know. Um, I think that a lot of ob guys also are aware of this information and, you know, they wouldn't refer someone unless they thought it was something more, but that's just something for us to think about. And then finally, you know, thinking about immunodeficiency, this really is, I think, a um, quite a big topic. I didn't get into all of the details here, but as we know, you know, there's urticaria, CSU, and there's things that can look a whole lot like CSU, but really aren't. There's something more. And for a lot of our immunodeficiency um, patients, these would be the considerations. Um, I will say even just this past year, there was somebody that came in 
the Digital Women's Hospital had a history of quote unquote urticaria and they ended up having muckle wells. So it definitely does happen. There are things that we do see. Um, once again, these are things that really you would not evaluate for unless something in that history points you towards it. Recurrent infections, fevers, arthritis, serositis, hepatosomalgamy, you know, ocular issues, things like that really are going to clue you in. These are just things that we always want to be thinking about because you never know who hasn't gotten evaluation elsewhere for other things and might be coming to you for the first time. So this is a really excellent paper that has a lot of great information and the QR code's there if anybody wanted to see more about that. So now as promised, I wanted to go through and just talk a little bit about you know, evaluations in Europe. They're a little bit different. Um, they do recommend this routine workup to include a CPC differential, ESR, CRP, and then they say admission is connected to drugs, which we would do that, of course, either way. Um, and then they have, once again, a very broad um, consideration for kind of clinically indicated workup. And there's a little bit you know, more broad than ours. They do, for example, include consideration of like a pseudo allergen free diet for a few weeks, um, things of that sort. And that I think like, was just really interesting for me to see and be mindful of because of course, urticaria is worldwide. Their treatments also do differ. I mean, they're quite similar when you look at our recommendations compared to theirs, but they do differ in some ways. I, I know everyone here is incredibly familiar with the therapy. I'll just kind of give a shout out here that they do not typically recommend mixing of antihistamines. Um, you know, for us, if someone's on a Zyrtec, might you add a doxepin, something like that? You could, they, they typically don't. Um, they also do specifically put omalizumab before the um, kind of cyclosporin and all of that. I think that's um, notable as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Stacy, so go back, go back a slide. When you say evaluation in Europe, since a lot of this is is wrong or antiquated, whose work uh, is this a European society and where does this come from? Uh, EAACI. So this is actually the recommendations of a European Allergy Commission? That is what I had found. I did hear that they either recently we're changing their guidelines or updating them, but this is something that I have found, yes. All right, I mean, it's pseudo allergen free diet for three weeks, for example, I don't think is anything anybody here would do. And some of this seems pretty old and antiquated information. Yeah, the, the pseudo allergen free diet, I know that this is a very, um, I guess, debated topic, I will say. When I was going through, and we'll talk about it maybe at the end if anybody's interested and we have time. I did look into some of the other, I would quote, you know, alternative treatments, and there was some data there saying that people have kind of patients have a response. I think there's a reason that we can talk about for that, but I mean, I would agree it's it's very different than you know what we what we have. I would agree with that, but um, I just thought it was very interesting kind of food for thought there. Yeah, well, for many of those listening, I wouldn't take this too seriously. Yes, and I, you know, I think that's really important um, as I go through things and learn myself, just understanding what other places do. You know, sometimes we have patients that will come from other countries or they'll have, you know, family in other countries and they will ask us these questions. And for me, I just like to understand kind of where that came from. Um, so that's, you know, why I included it there. I mean, particularly like if type one allergy workup means common inhalant skin testing, I mean, someone who's had chronic hives for six weeks, that's not an appropriate thing to do. Yeah, but interestingly, their example was um, like a latex allergy was something that they had mentioned there, which once again, I agree, that would be quite unique for someone to have that um, with that picture. But I think once again, this is a, you know, if it's indicated, maybe people are getting these referrals and they're having these kinds of patients come in um, that otherwise don't know what's going on. But, you know, I would say I agree. It's it's interesting, I think. It's just good to think about. So jumping forward to talk more about treatments, I'm going to discuss kind of based on our guidelines, um, information that we have regarding our various treatments. <laughs> 
When it comes to antihistamines, of course, all of us are very familiar with how we use antihistamines for our typical patients, so I was just going to jump straight through and talk about our special cases. Those special cases are going to include, you know, pregnancy, children, etc. So when we think about use of antihistamines in pregnancy, um, you know, there is kind of a lot of recommendations that we have that are based off of um, things that we kind of have to extrapolate from. Um, so really when you look at the different FDA class assignments to these various antihistamines, there's kind of a, a B or C range. And I would say that that C class was obtained from studies um, in animals where there was um, tridogenicity um, kind of with use of them. Whereas if they didn't have that, then, then they're a class B. So, um, you know, we do know that things like Zyrtec, um, or sorry, Cetirazine, Loratadine, those are ones that we typically will recommend for patients. I think, you know, either way, patients do quite well with them, but um, I think it's just always helpful for me to know where that guideline or where that information came from. Secondarily, you know, thinking about antihistamines not just in pregnancy, but also in breastfeeding, um, I think understanding for me the pharmacokinetics of how everything kind of works really brings home my understanding of these things. And really with antihistamines, less than 2% of that dose is, is getting into the fetus from the mother. So it's really a very, very small amount of an already typically small dosage. Um, we don't have great information on you know, outcomes or whatnot, but we do have some. There is a, just a survey that was done of, of different mothers who use antihistamines and it asked them whether or not they had any ill effects with their, with their kiddos. And really the majority said no. There was one that said maybe there's some irritability with like a, um, antihistamine use. And then there was also, you know, one actual study where they looked at um, loratadine and then also fexofenadine and the, the, the percentages of detection in maternal milk and that was, you know, 1.1% and 0.45% respectively. So once again, very, very low levels are getting into that breast milk. And if you're using something um, pretty much very low concern, you know, that it would really impact, impact the baby. Other special considerations are going to be for our patients with hepatic and renal insufficiency. Um, of course, you know, with these patients, they're talking about people but really with t really significant impairment. It's gonna be people on dialysis, um, you know, people with cirrhosis, really significant impairments, and they're going to have hepatologists and nephrologists assisting as well and making sure that they're really getting the right things. I know this chart's um, got a lot of information, but I thought it was just really helpful to see everything laid out clearly. I would say that really when you're looking at things, there are, for renal disease, um, maybe needs for dose adjustments. They had done studies and looking at, you know, how much antihistamine was in um, patients that had dialysis needs, et cetera. And they do, as it makes sense, have higher amounts um, of things like vexfenidine, cetirazine in their blood. And one of their studies actually, the nephrologist um, recommended that they do a five milligram three times a week before, um, after dialysis treatment, very similar to how they address things like antibiotics, et cetera. And when we think about hepatic issues, um, I think it's important for us to just keep in mind that any antihistamine really can precipitate like a liver encephalopathy in cases of very, very severe liver failure, but generally they're, that would be very appropriate for use. There are things that you can, you can use um, without a lot of concerns. Um, Levocetirazine is one that, for example, is not even metabolized by the liver, so there's really no need to adjust that for patients. And in general, the others, the others are fine as well. So now jumping forward to omalizumab, um, I just wanted to go through and just remind us kind of of that, you know, main finding way back that led us to, to use omalizumab. I know that I'm getting a little bit shorter on time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, but here, as we know, they looked at omalizumab every four weeks at 75 milligrams, 150 milligrams, and 300 milligram doses, or placebo. And then they have this 16-week observation period. And we know that both the 150 and 300 milligram group showed significant improvement to itch and high scores compared to placebo with 
44% resolution in the 300 milligram group and 22% in the 150 milligram group. The median time to kind of improvement, of course, was lower for the 300 milligram group at one week and then a little bit higher for the 150 group at two weeks. And that really has led us to use omalizumab for so many of our patients because it is so helpful. We're going to go through mechanisms, kind of what's known and what mechanisms at least, dosages and weaning, biomarkers, clinical factors, um, et cetera, et cetera. So when it comes to omalizumab, you know, there are a number of proposed mechanisms and how it really helps patients with CSU. Um, I mean, we know what omalizumab is. We know um, kind of how it does work in the body in some sense, but there are just other aspects. Um, oh, goodness. Um, there are other aspects that, you know, we want to be thinking about as we figure out, you know, why it really is so helpful for patients with CSU. Um, there's quite a bit of information here. These two papers are really excellent in this, but it's thought that maybe in addition to reducing the CRM Ig levels, there's reduction of kind of receptor numbers, that there's reversion of basopenia. Um, there's a lot of really you know interesting things that have been thought about and proposed for the mechanisms. In terms of dosing, it's approved for doses of 150 milligrams or 300 milligrams every four weeks. Um, once again, just a difference in how things are outside the United States. International guidelines typically recommend starting at 300 milligrams. Um, and aside from that, you know, studies have shown that increasing dosing to various levels can be helpful. There are a number of studies I looked at, including once I looked at dosing 450 every four weeks, 600 every four weeks, and one that went as high as 600 milligrams every two weeks just for a few doses to see how things um, did. And those studies typically were done in patients that did not respond to the earlier doses, and many of them did have some improvement. So there, there is data on pushing things up and having improvement and that the ill effects, you know, were not, were not seen. So it was generally um, well tolerated. When we think about weaning omalizumab, this is something that I've learned a lot from, from a lot of our, you know, amazing attendings, and they've kind of taught me their process. We know that, you know, omalizumab is not shown to be disease modifying or curative. So really it is needed as long as CSU is active, but as we know, CSU can and typically does resolve after some time and that you can wean omalizumab. Um, there's been a few different ways that people have approached it, but just to summarize, you know, really if you go to eight weeks um, and they're doing well without issues, you typically can consider to discontinue omalizumab. There's other, you know, details here, recommendations to stay on for at least six months, etc. But really that's the thing. If someone's doing incredibly well and they can go out to eight weeks and, and do, you know, without issue, then you can typically think about weaning that off. When we think about biomarkers, you know, there are ones that I think everyone knows. There's ones that at least I didn't know and I have learned recently. So we know total IgE, a low baseline, is associated with a poor response phenotype. Um, there was one study that said actually the, the ratio or the difference between it um, they found was more helpful, but we know total IgE is very important. Um, other things that we know about high sensitivity CRP is associated with resistance. Um, Eosinopenia and basopenia also have been associated with poor resistance or poor response to omalizumab, and then also other things like basophil activation tests, polygus serum studies. If they were done or if they were looked at, um, they may suggest a sole response. And then one study showed that omalizumab responders had serum that was less likely to induce expression of basophil CD203C, which is an activation marker of basophil. So there is, you know, more data looking into the information on this, and I think we're probably going to have a lot more looking in the future. Just a comment on that. I, I don't think anybody bothers clinically to measure any of these things. No, not at all. <laughs> and I don't think they would need to. So. <laughs> right. No, nor are they necessary to get yeah. approval. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of this is, you know, there's so much looking into what is the mechanism and, you know, what are the markers and all this information, but the real clinical importance is we know that patients respond so well that patients really do great with Zolaire, Oldsmobile Lab. They have a very favorable risk profile. 
Um, so I think, you know, people are going to use it. It's just kind of understanding why and getting more information on it. And speaking of using it, you know, there are clinical factors that, um, you know, you just want to keep in mind when using it. They, there has been a poor response linked to obesity or prior use of immunosuppressants for patients. So just really keep that in mind. And thinking about patients, we want to think about our special populations. Um, you know, we know this. Almost once it's approved for 12 and up. But, you know, there is data on use in children that they do respond to CSU. Also, to some of the inducibles, which, you know, is something that's been looking into as well. Um, and they really didn't have any adverse effects reported. So, though it is approved for 12 and up, it is used lower and does seem to, you know, have a good effect. Thinking about our pregnant or breastfeeding patients is something that we always want to be, you know, mindful of. Um, there's not a lot of data on this, but there was one study, the expect study, and looked at 230 pregnant women who had omalizumab for asthma, and it's found that they had no increased risk of general abnormalities, fetal deaths, or stillbirths with that exposure. So that's, I think, a really good for, thing for us to keep in mind and for us to know for our patients, because we will get questions like that. And then as we all know, adverse effects, I mean, it's very well tolerated. Of course, if you go to look at the sites, which our patients will do, you'll find a lot of information about possible things that can occur. But um, I think as we know, clinically, it's very well tolerated and it's something just for us to kind of give that reassurance to patients on. And we know that omalizumab, you know, in addition to being well tolerated, works so well, but what do you do when it's not working? You know, what's that next step? We have a number of options here, and we're going to talk about these. We're really focusing on cyclosporine, but also kind of mentioning the others as well. We have anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressants, with cyclosporine being our big one. And because cyclosporine has been around for so long, and we kind of have so much information on it, you know, I didn't put as much detail here on all of these, but we know the mechanism inhibits T cell function. We know the typical dosing, one to five milligrams per kilogram per day kind of has been the range of what's been studied. Response rate for a four milligram per kilogram day, typically in an adult is 60 to 70%, but of course studies have shown good response to lower doses and a lot of us do use that. There are numerous biomarkers to consider, histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, um, clinical factors, those with kind of that more type B autoimmunity we talked about earlier are going to have probably, you know, a better response. And then um, adverse effects, hypertension, abnormal serum creatinine, those are things that are really dose and duration dependent, and there's more details there, but um, I think we're all well aware of those evaluations and know to monitor our patients. And then one thing that I just wanted to mention was, um, you know, in a lot of studies, people that don't respond to cyclosporin or to omalizumab themselves, when they had the combination, seem to do um, in some way better for a number of patients. So that's something that I'll be keeping in mind as well. For the other anti-inflammatories and um, immunosuppressants, you know, there's a lot of information. This is, once again, a very helpful table. I'm just going to go through and kind of list some things that I thought were relevant for um, the main ones here. When we look at different kinds of treatments, I included ultraviolet light here because it was, I think, um, very interesting. It's been found that if you use ultraviolet light, which is UVA or UVB, there is improvement to patients um, with urticaria. It's typically been studied most in solar urticaria, as we know, but also in CSU. In one study, they use UVB, and the combination of that and um, levocetirazine improved UAS score, uh, UAS7 scores compared to just levocetirazine, which I thought was very interesting. Um, another study looked at both UVA and UVB and in patients refractory to high dose antihistamines. And after 90 days of therapy, the UVA group had a reduction in their UAS7 from around 30% to like 13%, whereas UVB, UVB group had a reduction from about 30% to 10%. So that was um, quite interesting. Next on the list is Dapsone. Um, you know, I think 
all of the people in the crowd here have a lot more experience than me and have used a number of these. These are things that I've learned, but I'm sure this is a reminder for you guys on things that you already know, but I'll just kind of go through. Um, so the job zone response rates are about 30 to 50% for complete resolution, improvement around 70 to 80%, so works quite, you know, quite reasonably. Um, you want to really think about the adverse effects here, like um, methamyglobinemia and other things that can happen with Dapsone, but you know it does seem that people have a good response. For azathioprine, there's less data on that. It's a little bit more limited, um, but there was one study that compared azathioprine and cyclosporine, um, which we know helps. And there was improvement in both groups with actually a bigger reduction in the UAS7 in azathioprine compared to cyclosporine. Um, and the adverse effects were pretty rare in both groups. So um, I think that was, that was helpful for me to see. For tacrolimus, it's been evaluated for use kind of in a variety of doses, like two to five um, mix per day. And it's demonstrated about a 75% response rate um, with more than half of patients having pretty much a complete response and then 25% um, remaining kind of in remission after discontinuation, which is really interesting. And then there are, of course, some potential benefits to using tacrolimus over cyclosporine when we think about those adverse effects that we want to be mindful of. Mycophenolate has been demonstrated to be effective um, in some observational studies of refractory patients. We don't have a lot of information on that. And then methotrexate has been evaluated, but it's not really been shown to have a lot of improvement. So not better than placebo, um, not really better than a lot of things on its own. There once again was this very interesting study that showed that if you used methotrexate with omalizumab and patients who did not respond to omalizumab originally, then they do actually have some kind of um, improvement in a small amount of patients. So that I think is just always something that I wanna keep in mind that maybe combining things could be helpful. And then really for the rest, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, colchicine, there's not a lot of data on these. We don't really have um, great information on that. So those are ones that, you know, I'll be looking out for if people are to look into them in the future. Stacy, just based, this is experience, not studies. I mean, far and away of all these drugs, cyclosporin is the best. And mm -hmm. the one advantage it has in my mind, even over, um, omalizumab is how quickly it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people have been struggling with chronic hive for at least six weeks by definition, and many of them much longer. And you can often get a response in cyclosporin in a matter of days. Well, usually omalizumab is at least going to take a month for the, for the first dose. Um, and you're talking about, you know, people being satisfied and with improvement, uh, I, obviously, I used it a lot over the years. It works quite rapidly for people. And if you know what you're doing with it, it's really a pretty safe drug. Uh, all the other ones on this table, I would say, are sort of secondary. Uh -huh. In my experience, monolucast doesn't work at all. It's a, yeah. a waste of time. Oh, um, yeah, I meant to mention that, but I think most people also would agree with that. <laughs> All right. That, I mean, that's just, you know, my opinion. That's not based in science. And I will say that is by far and away kind of what um, what I've learned and what I found. Um, I have been, as I've been getting through fellowship, really working to understand what do I do for patients that don't respond to Zolier. And I will say that far and away, cyclosporine is, is used broadly, kind of in like different levels, but it's generally very well tolerated. And that's something that was so helpful for me to see, just to understand that clinically it, it, it is used and it does help patients in an and is so quick acting. So um, absolutely, I think that's really important for us to remind everybody of. And thanks for mentioning that one. So kind of in our last few minutes, um, we're getting kind of right up to the wire. I just wanted to mention that there are other biologics that have been used in patients with CSU with some good response. Um, Dupilumab in you know preclinical studies, as we know, had blocked several functions of mast cells. Um, and then there was this a case report where they showed benefit of Dupilumab in the treatment of six patients with CSU that had failed to respond to omalizumab. So I thought that was interesting. For benalizumab, um, mepolizumab, and resolizumab, they, you know, as 
as we talked about earlier, um, we know the importance of eosinophils kind of in this whole this whole player, and there have been different studies kind of looking at the responses for CSU, inducible urticarias, or both, um, and they all have been shown some success. So I think that's very very interesting. And then also um, psychokinemab is one that I think there's interest in in looking at it. There were some studies there. Um, in one study, it did reduce disease activity pretty significantly in patients with CSU who are refractory to other things like omalosumab or cyclosporin. But once again, these are not like FDA approved ones. These are ones that people have used in studies and just for us to be mindful of. And then um, looking into the future, there are a lot of other biologics that are under development, under consideration. Apologies that I'm going to write up to um, 8 p.m. There is a lot of information kind of in the future, but as you can see, there's a lot for us to look forward to and a lot for us to get excited about. So um, I think this is information that I will be looking more for, um, you know, in the coming years. There was excitement about legalizumab, um, yeah. but it failed in its trial to be any better than omalizumab. Yes. Yeah. I heard about that too. I was quite excited for that one. Um, but yeah, I did hear about that as well recently. It's unfortunate. Well, it's eight o'clock, Stacy. I just ask if anybody's, I don't know if you have any more slides, but I think we need oh, to end. I think I should and... stop. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you guys for hanging with me. Um, if anyone's interested in learning about these, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss. I didn't share my slides today because I did include my personal photographs, but if anybody wanted information, I'm happy to send it to you or, or talk more. Thank you guys so much for giving me your time today. I appreciate you listening to me talk about CSU. Anybody uh, have a question to throw in here uh, before we? All right, well, a couple of uh, thank yous for an excellent talk, which I agree. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I'm wondering, um, this is just a question thrown out there, if for the future, if any of the JAK inhibitors that we're using because obviously um, there has to be signal transduction here for granular release from these cells. I don't know of any data about using JAK inhibitors, uh, but they're being used in almost everything else. So who knows? Yeah, there was some information. Um, I would say not a lot of information, but there was, I think, like at least one report where they used um, ruxolitinib and a patient with refractory CSU, and they had some improvement. Um, I think it was kind of more smaller, smaller reports, but yeah, I also thought about that as well. Oh yeah, and I see that somebody wants me to share my slides. Um, I definitely can't, I can, um, if it's okay, I can maybe remove my own photographs and I can share these slides um, so they can be sent out. Is that okay, Len? Sure. Okay. And get, somebody wants the word of the day again. Uh, I think it was, it was autumn. autumn. It autumn. was autumn. 